This is a, uh, an amazing forum to see you all so far in the back. It's, it's intimidating, it's daunting, but it is an honor and a privilege to be here to say thank you to Air Education and Training Command to say thank you for what you do. I'm a recipient of your airmen, and I gotta tell you how appreciative I am of what you do, and equally important of how you do it. But I'm fearful that we don't say that enough to you. You are the foundation of everything that is good in our Air Force. Without your product, your airmen, all the capabilities that we talk about across our Air Force would not exist. Too often, though, we don't let you know the impact and how it plays forward. You don't get to see the value of the airmen that you produce. Every so often they call back to you, but what are they doing? Are they making a difference? So what I would like to do today is through the eyes of the mobility family, share with you the impact of your airmen and the product that you produce. Matt, if you would, let's show a couple of the images, please. say yes. Every one of you have your own story that you keep right here. Those are just some of the faces and some of the stories of the people that our Air Force has touched this past year. But we don't often share that with you. So today we're going to talk about some of those stories. We're going to talk about that and often I talk about what do we do. And in the mobility family we do three things overarching. We deliver hope with airlift. We fuel the fight with air refueling. And with air medical evacuation, we save lives. We're part of this great joint team. But today, I really don't want to talk and stop at what we do. I want to go to the next level. Why do we do what we do? I know you've had Simon Sennett come down here and the Chiefs talked about it, but why as airmen do we do what we do? So Chief Kaiser and I, and before him, Chief Spector, have spent the past couple years going out and talking to thousands of airmen. And with two simple questions, why do you love what you do? And what stories do you hold most dear? And our airmen come back with something that is so simple but so resounding. Sir, we answer the call. Sir, we answer the call of others so they can prevail something so simple. And if you think about it, that's what we do. We answer the call. But without what you provide, because you provide the skills, the training, so we can do something about it. Because with a great airman, I can only do so much. With an airman who has skills and competencies that you give him or her, we can answer the call and make a huge difference. But who are we that we're talking about? We are 135,000 airmen in the Mobility Air Forces, Active Guard and Reserve. You have touched every one of us. You are us. You have given us skills for jet. You have given us skills for 
you know, air crew, maintenance, every AFSC that is in our family, you provide that capability. And we're also commercial, we're also contractors because it's our contractors that are here that give us this capabilities that we use. In my part of the world, it's my commercial aviation partners because 90% of all the passenger movement is done by commercial aviation partners. 30%, 7% of all of our cargo. If you're going home in a commercial aircraft, that's a good thing. If you're coming back here to San Antonio on a great tail, it's probably a life-saving ride, but it's probably not a good event. We're hoping to keep you alive. So commercial, our aviation partners, will have spent $2.6 billion with our commercial aviation partners. It's huge. What they provide is phenomenal. Too often, though, we as airmen talk about the machine, the airplane, the vehicle, whatever. And I'll tell you, those have no heart. They're aluminum, they're steel, they're titanium, they're cold. What has heart are the airmen. And what do our airmen focus on? They focus on those who depend on us. They focus on families in Japan. They focus on soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines stationed in Afghanistan. They focus on civilians in Libya this past year. Why? Because those people depend on us. We will never be the subject of the sentence, nor should we be. We'll never be on the marquee. We support others so they can be successful. And that's what we do, and that's what makes me most proud of us as airmen. And has it been a busy year? Oh my gosh, has it been busy. You know, we thought 2010, we got the t-shirt. We survived 2010, the busiest year in our history. And we were saying, hey, life's going to be good in 2011. And then as March approached, we're all getting ready to watch the basketball games, but we had a different sense of March Madness in what we were doing. Because in March Madness, we had a huge Riptoa as the Army was repositioning, coming out of Iraq and were restructuring in Afghanistan. Huge airlift, I mean, air movement with the fighters and the CAF and the AEF as we were drawing down Iraq, restructuring Afghanistan, and plus doing a large rotation. Three exercises, Korea, Singapore, and Thailand. We had the largest presidential move, not to a country, but to the South American continent, all going on. And then we have to have this thing we're starting to worry about called, you know, Arab Spring. Worried about what's happening in Syria, Yemen. What's going to happen in Bahrain, Tunisia, Egypt. What's happening in Libya. What's happening with this election in the Ivory Coast that's not going so well. So we're doing all the mission analysis because something may need our assistance. So we're preparing for it. And then the call comes. But it's not from where we thought. Because immediately the call comes from Japan. We have the earthquake, followed by the tsunami traveling at 530 miles an hour. We need help immediately. So we fall in under General Field. We fall under General North and Admiral Willard, using the plans that General Rice had just worked on as USFJ commander. And the first thing we're going to do is respond with humanitarian assistance. We divert a C-17 into March Air Refueling Base, pick up the search and rescue team out of Los Angeles, air refuel them nonstop, and they're into Japan trying to help with delivering food and water to help them recover. A very competent nation didn't need as much as other nations have in the past. But very quickly, people are concerned about the reactors. So we go into a consequence management situation, bringing in dosometers, boron to help try and cool those reactors, and also the Navy radiological assessment team because we're not sure how that's going to play out. And then followed by the third event of the triple header, our families are saying, you know, we're uncomfortable being here. Can we go home? And so they allow the evacuation and movement of families out of Japan. It could be up to 90,000 family members. And so we are going to call our commercial partners. Hey, can you get us some 747s, some 767s to go into Japan and bring them back first to Seattle? And then we'll move them onward to their families. Very quickly, we max out Seattle. Oh, and by the way, it's spring break week. So it's hard to get those aircraft, and the airlines are pretty full, but they come to our rescue. And Seattle's max, so we start moving into Travis, because all the aircraft are flush, so let's bring them into Travis. We have four commercial bases. And here's where, just as San Antonio would be here for General Carter and the bases here, just as any of your honorary commanders would be there for you, the community around Travis 
goes out around and says, you know what, these families are coming in for a couple hours an afternoon before they go on. This is their last chance, because they didn't plan to be leaving Japan, to have, get diapers, to go to the commissary, to seek legal if they have to have a power of attorney, to see the financial folks. And so what I saw most, and despite all the sorties and all the missions, were the honorary commanders, that community around Travis and our airmen, basically taking the terminal and turning it into a family readiness center. I had sergeants hugging kids. I had folks changing diapers. I had airmen taking pets coming off the airplane. We had you know, a lot of dog bites, too, because they weren't too happy about being moved. But we were doing this. And it's phenomenal to see our airmen respond in a way that we do in our communities. So when you go back home, make sure you hug those honorary commanders, because I'll tell you some more stories, but boy, the community support we have around our bases, around your bases, is simply huge. So while that's going out, and we were fortunate that only about 7,800 family members wanted to leave. So we well got it down from the 90,000 that could have been. But while that's going on, this airdrop stuff that we're doing is really important. In fact, let me tell you about one of the first airdrop calls. We had a unit that was separated from the, their 77th division. And they called back, they got a call back in to the rear echelon. We are going, we're out of food and water and ammo. We are going to perish. Please send help. Two um, airmen get into their aircraft, Lieutenant Bleckley and Gettler, and they take off and they can't find the unit. Imagine that. Come back, get some more gas, and they find the unit. And they pass over and they drop the first time, and they're too high and they miss the drop zone. They come back around a second time, and they circle in, and they get lower, and they drop. They're on target, but they're shot down, and they're killed. They're awarded the Medal of Honor. Do you remember hearing about it? You, don't, you didn't hear about it? Well, folks, the year was 1918. The aircraft they were using was the DH-4. How they got the call back to the echelon was a carrier pigeon. The unit was the battalion of the Lost Brigade in the Battle of the Argonne Forest. Since that time in 1918 to, as I fast forward us to 2005, what we use has significantly changed. The ethos of those airmen to do the mission to deliver hope to those folks who needed it, I would offer to you, has not changed. And that ethos is something that you continue to teach to give to all of those young civilians who come join our Air Force. Because when they show up in my side of the world, they have it. You have given that to them. Thank you. Now, as I fast forward to 2005 in Afghanistan, 2 million pounds of airdrop. As I continue to double that number to 80 million pounds in 2011. 80, what's that number mean? A C-17 is about 50,000 pounds when it passes through and drops. A C-130 is about 22,000 pounds. That's a lot of lift, a lot of airdrops to get to 80 million pounds, but why? Well, when we plussed up Afghanistan, we put those 30,000 soldiers and Marines on the perimeter, and their ability to get supplied is so limited from land. And by the way, if they use land, they're exposed to IEDs and to snipers, so we are airdropping food, water, ammunition into them more than ever before. And by the way, as we start drawing down, next year we'll do 10 to 20 percent more because we're drawing down the force structure inside of Afghanistan, and those shooters are all going to be there. So our requirement's going up. Does this airdrop make a difference? And, and I could tell you story after story about the FOBs. But I'm going to use a different story to let you know the impact that we often don't hear. And this one is an airdrop that occurred in the province of Nuristan. The villagers called in and said, look, the Taliban have surrounded us. They're mad at us, and they've cut off all food coming into our village. Can you send help? So I went back to IUD, to the AMD, to the tactics folks, and they said, OK, this village rests between two large mountains, very narrow pass. And we said, yes, we can, because that's what we do. But we knew we couldn't drop on top of the village, so we needed a drop zone just off at the base of the mountain. So our folks came up with using a high velocity chute. We had a drop at altitude, but we had a problem because we didn't have a drop zone. 
and we had no way of securing a drop zone, so if we dropped, the Taliban would take it and run off with it. No, no victory. So ISAF forces said, we'll put the ANA, Afghan National Army, in there, helicopter them in to secure the drop zone. You go, we went and did the drop. Our riggers at Bagram already do 120 bundles a day. We said, we need a favor. It's our army riggers. Can you give us an extra 40 bundles? Yes, sir, what do you need? We need rice and tea. 62,000 pounds, you got it. So we call it a drop of a million cups of tea. And that's what we did. At 17,000 feet, we went over, 40 bundles out the aircraft, and they all dropped just east of the village at the base of the mountain. Perfect. The ANA actually had the drop zone secured. They took the tea and the rice, and they distributed it to the villagers. So when those folks saw that aircraft, if they could see it, instead of seeing a machine of war, they saw wings of hope, if they saw it all. But that's not really that important. Getting them the tea and the rice they needed to keep them alive to thwart the Taliban was important. And here's something we don't talk about, playing it forward. What did the villagers see for the first time in their lives? They got to see the ANA, the Afghan National Army, secure a drop zone, take rice and tea, break it down, and hand it to the community, to the citizens. Think of the relationship that now will be there forever that this village will now trust the Afghan National Army who didn't exist before because we were there to assist, to enable as it played forward. Think of the impact of what we're trying to do at a strategic level, playing out at a tactical level, right there. Absolutely amazing. Now, why this is all playing out, I was talking about March Madness. Well, that call did come in at March Madness, but the call came in to me like this. Hey, General Johns, how quickly can you get 24 KC-135s and four KC-10s to Spain? Well, what's the situation? We knew what it was. Gaddafi is about to unleash his military and kill his own people. We now have a UN resolution and we'll have a coalition, but until we have that, we're going to take basically General Welsh's fighters from Yusefi. The French are there, fly them down. Okay, we have limo here, fly them down, but the problem is they don't have the range and the loiter time to stay over Libya. So we need to have air refueling assets. They came now from Mildenhall, and they came from the rest of the mobility forces to get there, to sustain them. Okay, we can do this. How quickly do you want there? We want them there now. What are we gonna do? Got it. Well, since we're doing an AEF rotation, we can put a couple tankers down. That, that makes sense. Oh, and by the way, we're coming back from that presidential mission in South America. I had six tankers in the Puerto Rico. They had one pair of clean underwear because they were going home the next day. We said, that's okay, take off, head to Spain. You could, there's a laundromat there, and they took off and headed to Spain. They weren't planning to go in there. And then I looked around the active duty because I needed more, and I didn't have active duty airmen to use. They were already at Al Udeeb, Manas, and Al Dafra. So I went to the guard and reservers I do every day and said, I need help. I needed a commander for this operation, and I called Brigadier General Roy up the graph, the guard commander of the Pittsburgh unit, and said, Roy, can you take this mission? Yes, sir, I got it. When do I need to leave? Tomorrow morning. Sir, I got it. On that phone call, he was deployed for 93 days. On phone calls that went out across the command, basically we had 19 units that were leaving in the next day or day and a half to get to Spain. 534 airmen, instead of saying goodnight to their families, said goodbye. One airman was at uh, McConnell, and he was taking his wife out to dinner. On the way, he never got to dinner. He was airborne five hours from the phone call. One airman came into Fairchild and says, okay, I'm here, what gives? And his supervisor, who I met, goes, well, you look a little pale, what's going on? He goes, well, my girlfriend's in the car, and you called me into work. He goes, well, okay, well, we're on our way to elope. And he goes, okay. <laughs> Why don't you get married and get your butt back here tomorrow? Good supervisor. So, honey, we're getting married. Good news. Welcome to the Air Force. He was gone for 90 days. <laughs> we laugh, but you know, we do this so often. And so that, over that period of time, that day and a half, 534 airmen, 19 units went to Maroon. And they descended upon a lieutenant colonel by the name of Ralph Flores, who was the air base squadron commander 
115 airmen, 400 contractors. And we descended on him. They had a chow hall. I'm an old person, not a defect. And it was under renovation. So they took the club and converted it to the chow hall, took all the booze out of the bar and made it the in-flight kitchen. That's innovating. And that night, 19 wings, a total of 40 units total, came in and went to Marone. And some folks went to bed, but my security forces, my tacticians, my intel, our maintainers, our um, FSS, all got together to generate those aircraft. And then I'm going to pause for a minute because think about what I just said. 19 different wings from the states, 40 total units when you take all of you safe and everybody else, came together with 24 135s and 4 KC-10s. And they turned those aircraft and they took off the next morning to meet that armada and they stayed there for March and their mission ended at the end of October. 12,000 air refuelings, mostly to coalition fighters. You allowed that to occur and you didn't even know it. Active Guard and Reserve, the youngest airmen to a lot of chiefs, lieutenants to colonels and a general, could all come together from across our entire Air Force, Active Guard and Reserve, and work together with common techniques, procedures and standards to turn everybody's aircraft green to generate those sorties, to keep generating those from March to October. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the AEF on steroids. That is instant deployment. And you, because of what you provide our Air Force, enable that. And no one says thank you. So when we criticize and say, gee, AETC, is there, they dot their I's, they cross the T's, guess what, thank you. Okay, because if you didn't do it in a standard way, we would have had a mess at Marone. We would not have been able to generate and support General Woodward. So thank you. You allowed that to occur. 12,000 refuelings. There are so many people alive in Libya that have no idea when they look up they're alive because there were assets, a lot of coalition, a lot of USISR overhead, preventing the bad guys from killing them. They have no idea that a lot of that coalition was being refueled by U.S. Air Force. They have no idea that a lot of airmen said goodbye to their families instead of goodnight. Oh, and if, by the way, you're single, who's going to help you pickle your life when you send you out after four or six hours and say you're gone for three months? And we couldn't have done it without you. Simply amazing. But sometimes we're not talking about a nation. Sometimes we're talking about how do we help one individual, and we'll go to any length to save somebody's life. I'll tell you about Sergeant Thomas Moore, simple soldier in Ramadi on his MRAP. He's just doing a maintenance detail of discharging his fire extinguisher. That's the last thing he remembers. Hit in the chest and it killed him. He's down. Some soldier at some point comes along and sees him dead, starts CPR. They bring it, he's got a pulse. They throw him in the back of a vehicle and a helicopter, get him to Baghdad. There the docs go, wow, he's comatose. We have no long idea how long he's been dead. We have no idea how much brain damage he's suffered. We do not want to try and revive him here. So these Air Force docs go, okay, what are we going to do? Well, we need to get him somewhere. Let's get him to launch tool. So we'll work the emergency air vac and the CCAT. But how do we get him there? I kid you not, because I met the doc. He goes, let's, let's chill him out. Now, I call it hypothermia. Since they're doctors, they call it therapeutic hypothermia. So they get on the internet, kid you not, said, Hypoth uh, hypothermia, yeah. OK, ice. OK, you all go around the base, the defect, the firehouse, and get a bunch of ice. You go get the blender. So they start putting this guy in ice. They have to get him down to 89 to about 90 degrees. They get the blender out because they take the ice and they chop it up and they put it down his stomach and they put it up his bladder. They get a freezer out and they start taking his IV fluids and chill them before they go into his body. They put a small hole in his head because they're worried about brain swelling. And, and Doc, you're going to get me later on, I know, but let me just, I'm, I'm a neophyte at this, okay? They put a hole in his head because they want to worry about brain swelling and so they're going to monitor that part of him. And they say, he's ready for transport. Let's get him. So we divert an aircraft in, get the AE team, and get the CCAT team and say, let's get him to launch to as quickly as we can. OK, we can do this. Oh, and by the way, crew, 
Your requirement is to keep the aircraft as cold as possible. Sorry, loadmaster, crank it down. Hand out the blankets. We get him on the aircraft for a simple transport, but his heart, at a good moment, is at 30. And the crew that took him there, the CCAT team and the AE team, almost lost him about a half a dozen times. They call him the miracle soldier because they had no idea if he would even make it there. And they had no idea what would happen when eventually we tried to wake him up. So he gets there at launch stool. He's there for two days. They start warming him up. He comes down here. He wakes up down here. And he goes, where am I? You're in San Antonio. He goes, well, I was in Ramadi when what happened? And they tell him the story. They call him the miracle soldier. And the amazing thing is the doctors at Baghdad, the doctors on the CCAT, the nurses and the med techs on the A team had no idea what happened to him. We were at a, a gathering and we got to reunite Sergeant Moore with his medical folks because so often, rarely do you get to see the results of your effort. And it was amazing to see that reunion, to see about what it meant to save one life. He's back with his unit. It's simply amazing. We did that for one soldier and we'll do it for anybody else who needs our help because that's what we do. And you know, we always talk about us being the providers of care, but in the flick of a moment, we can be the recipients. And I'll talk about Miracle Monday at Little Rock Air Force Base. We have an AETC wing, a guard wing, and we have an air mobility wing there. And that Miracle Monday is when a tornado came through the base, destroyed and leveled, damaged 200 buildings and 146 homes. Before Colonel Minahan could even reach out, the community, again, was on base, saying, we're here to help first responders. We're here to help make sure that all of our families, they called them their families, had places to stay, food, shelter. And so the honorary commanders of that community, once again, was here to support us, as so often you support them. Because they had to make a decision that night because they were starting to deploy the next day. Can we deploy because we need to go forward with the 130 mission? And they looked around and they said, you know what, there is so much community support here at Little Rock that I know as an airman that my family would be tended to. And so their answer of these initial first 100 airmen that grew to 400 airmen was yes, we will deploy despite having my house destroyed, despite having my cars and wrecked, despite having, you know, flooded out this and that. So that next day they started deploying and they went forward, the 130 unit, they met up with Yakota, and when they got there, they started flying their mission. And if you ask these folks, was it worth it? They'll say, sir, let me tell you about Operation Proper Exit. And yeah, it was worth it. So our crew of Chrome 45 is up in Iraq. And they're picking up these soldiers that are wounded warriors. And they're going, what gives? Well, sir, this is Operation Proper Exit. And what are you doing? Well, these soldiers didn't get to li leave Iraq at a place and time of their choosing. They left on one of your gray tails in an AE situation or CCAT situation. We brought them back home. We helped heal their physical wounds. But now we're bringing them back to Iraq to the point and place where they were hurt, where they were injured and we're letting them leave at a place and time of their choosing to help those emotional wounds, to help that emotional scarring. One of the guys getting on the aircraft was Staff Sergeant Bobby Henline. Now they put him up in the cockpit because Bobby suffered some pretty, some pretty severe wounds and the ability for him to cool his body is not there and putting him in the back of 130 was not a good, so he's up in the cockpit. He tells a story, 2007 in his Humvee, he's the only one that got to live when the IED went off. And after all the procedures, he is physically healthy, or as healthy as he'll be, but not so emotionally. So he was back in Iraq. He was on that airplane, and he got to leave at a place and time of his choosing. And as they crossed over from Iraq to Kuwait, all those soldiers got up no matter where they were in the airplane, some on prosthetics, and cheered and high five because they were leaving Iraq their way this time. And when they landed at Kuwait, that crew ran down after they shut the engines, got to that ramp, and they said, we're here to give you the salute that you deserve. 
and they saluted Bobby Henline and those other soldiers, they left. Why am I telling you the story? Bobby Henline is an inspirational speaker. He goes around our country helping people understand how to thrive when they're faced with great adversity. Bobby Henline was helped in a small, small way by the Airmen of Chrome 45. The Airmen of Chrome 45 went forward because, and it's all, it would have been somebody else if it wasn't them, because they felt that they could leave their families behind because the community was able to tend to their families and their other needs where they could go deploy. So think about the simple impact of one act by a community to help a base, to allow somebody to deploy, to help an individual who's helping and touching thousands of people. That's the idea of playing it forward. Some would call it the butterfly effect. And you have that impact every day yet we don't do a good enough job of connecting you to it. And if you're commanders or supervisors, it's so important to do that with our airmen right now in these very challenging times of what the future holds, to value what we do and to share that and celebrate that. Because it takes a large team. And right here in AETC, you start it with us because you recruit these civilians these young, wonderful people who come into our service in our Air Force, and you create warrior airmen of character. You then go and give them the technical training they need across the spectrum of our AFSCs, our skill sets. And they come to people like us, and we get to use them. Then you continue with education, PME, other higher academic education, and you open their minds. And so thank you. But two things that you have to understand that you do that nobody else does. Common standards, practices, and procedures. We couldn't have done Libya without that that you give us. Second, something we don't talk about. You create an environment of innovation. The chief just talked about every airman and innovator. What is this innovation thing? It's so important to what we are as a service. World War I, we're going through the trenches. Airmen said, let's go over the trenches with airplanes, observation balloons, other techniques and procedures. Let's use strategic bombardment. Let's use the Berlin airlift to break that blockade with airlift. Let's use air medical evacuation in a way we've never used before, that we have a 98% probability of keeping somebody alive if we get them into the system. Vietnam, it was 70%. I will tell you, folks, that's innovation. Or some of the capabilities, stealth, GPS, innovation. And so as a culture, we do that. As a culture, you provide that environment to stimulate innovation. From children in Japan who now, because they survived this, earthquake will get to grow up and be teachers, philosophers, musicians, to citizens in Libya who are now alive to help determine the destination of their own country, to soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, and fellow, fellow airmen, rather, who will get to not only survive what we've asked them to do in Afghanistan and Iraq, but will now thrive in a small, small way because of what we have helped provide them with our vigilance, reach, and power. They'll come back and be business leaders, lead our nation. And that's a good thing, because you think about it in 20 years, who's going to be leading our nation? It's going to be all those folks with military service. That's huge. And it's because of what we provide in small part. I can't tell you where the next call will come in from. But last night, while I'm studying some of the stuff, we got a call. Sir, we have a ship that's sinking in the South Antarctic, a Korean ship. And PACOM, PACAF, is operating this mission down the ice. We like to use the C-17 because 35 seamen, civilian Korean seamen, are going to be rescued from the sinking ship. Seven have severe burns and moderate burns. We want to use the C-17 that PACAF is operating to go bring them off the ice up to Christchurch. Folks, that's playing out right now. That was the last call. So I don't know when the next call will come in, if it's a single act or it's a major national issue. But I know 
Someone, somewhere, needs something. And I know that we will say yes, we will answer that call. Because that's what we do. And we can answer the call and do something because you, in this wonderful command, this wonderful community of teachers, gives us the capability to do that. So from the mobility family from our Air Force, from us to you, thank you for giving us the capability to answer the call. Thank you very much.